I want to begin with prayer. I invite you to stand. I'll be praying a prayer that was once prayed by the President of the United States. Almighty God, ruler of all peoples of the earth, forgive our shortcomings as a nation, purify our hearts to see and love the truth, give wisdom to our leaders and steadfastness to our people, and bring us at last to that fair city of peace whose foundations are mercy, justice, and goodwill, of which you are the designer and builder. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A word about Percy Christian and John Christian and this annual lecture. Percy Christian was president of Pacific Union College from 1945 to 1950, and he ended his career here after serving as president both at Walla Walla and Emmanuel Missionary College as a teacher of history. His son John was an experienced and skillful teacher in Walla Walla uh, and also at Columbia Union College at Andrews University and he taught here and he was academic dean at Pacific Union College. The annual lecture, well let's put it this way, PUC has big dreams about this Civil Rights Conference Center. And the annual lecture is just the beginning. It is based on a lead gift from Shirley Christian Utt and her daughter Jennifer Newton. And I would like them to stand now, wherever you are. Would you please like stand? <laughs> stay, stay standing. And then I think we have some spouses, children, and grandchildren. If you'd stand as well. This year's speaker is Terrence J. Roberts. He was one of the Little Rock Nine, which means that an awful lot of people know about his high school education and maybe not so much about other things he accomplished. For high school, we can say one rather shocking statement. It took the 101st Airborne to open the school doors so that Terry could attend Little Rock Central High School. The rest of his education, he got a bachelor's degree at Cal State LA. He got a master's from UCLA and a doctorate in psychology from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. 1975, when John Christian was academic dean here at PUC, he was invited to come to PUC. He taught several years here, and later in his career, he taught at Antioch University. He was also an administrator at St. Lynn Hospital, at UCLA, where he was an assistant dean, uh, and in other places. He's currently running a management consultant firm He's the author of two books, one entitled Simple, Not Easy, Reflections on Community Social Responsibility and Tolerance, and the most recent, Lessons from Little Rock. That book has a moving dedication to his grandsons. Terry wrote, boys, the world is not yet reshaped in the way I would have it for you. But many of the obstacles I faced are no longer apparent. May the God of this universe guide your navigations through this uncertain terrain. Dr. Roberts is an inspiring speaker, a provoker of questions. His title this afternoon is Keeping Watch, Heeding the Call, and Speaking Up. Would you welcome Dr. Terry Roberts? Thank you, Eric, for a stirring introduction. Thank all of you for taking time to come this evening. Our title, Keeping Watch, Heeding the Call, Speaking Up, bears a bit of explanation. 
we're going to try and do today is to talk about what does it truly mean to keep watch. If you were to talk to my two daughters and inquire, what did you hear most often from your father when you were growing up? Without hesitation, they would respond, pay attention, pay attention. In that sense, that's the keeping watch. Your task will be to pay attention to what goes on around you. Why? Because things are being done and said that you need to hear in terms of interpreting what your call is, and that's the second piece, heeding the call. I'm convinced that because each of us is unique in the universe, no one else is you. Once you're gone, you're extinct. But while you are here, your task is to heed the call that is yours. That call comes most directly from the God we serve. You're here for a purpose. You're not here just willy-nilly because it was a fun ride. No, you're here to, to do something, and that involves speaking up. That's the third part. I was here on Thursday speaking to an audience over in the sanctuary, and I recited a poem by Emily Dickinson, and I said to them, being involved in that poem motivated me to think about adding another poem at some point in the talk. Well, that thought slipped away. It left, I didn't do it. But I'm thinking today, I'll make up. I'll make that up with a poem that fits with this theme. It may not seem so readily when I recite it, but you'll get it as I talk. And the poem was written by County Cullen in the early 20s, the early 20th century. 1920. The poem is entitled, Incident. On a streetcar in old Baltimore, head filled, heart filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now, I was eight and very small, and he was no whit bigger, and so I looked at him and smiled. He stuck out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December. Of all the things that happened there, that's the one thing I remember. At any rate, keep that in mind as we go through these words. In the aftermath of the Civil War, the 39th Congress of these United States of America submitted a bill that would provide civil rights to the recently enslaved and now newly freed men, women, and children of African descent. The bill stipulated that this group of formerly enslaved people would be classified as citizens, but as to whether they would enjoy all the rights and privileges that such status would convey would quickly become a point of contention the first iteration of the bill was presented to President Andrew Johnson in 1865, and it was promptly vetoed by President Johnson. He vetoed the 1886, 1866 version as well, but the Congress was able to muster the required two-thirds vote of the combined houses, and the bill became law in 1866. This was the first federal law defining citizenship in the United States. And here's how the law was described by historian Eric Fona. The first statutory definition of American citizenship, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, declared all persons born in the United States, except Indians, national citizens, and spelled out the rights they were to enjoy equally without regard to race. This action was quickly followed by the addition of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution in 1868. This was seen as the most definitive statement to date about the citizenship rights of formerly enslaved people. Now, so far, it seems that things are on track to ensure that black people who are now free of the bonds of slavery will be granted all the rights that citizens enjoy. But you know, as well as I know, that this was not to be the case. There was something in the national character that could not or would not accept black people as full citizens. Nonetheless, those who were 
and had been engaged in the struggle for civil rights continued to fight. The evidence is there in the passage of more civil rights acts, more barriers to full participation by all citizens removed, much clear rhetoric in support of those who were denied access to opportunities on myriad levels in our society. But all of this has not proven to be especially fruitful. We continue to be a nation divided by multiple lines of separation, not the least of which is that of legalized racial group identity. The division is further amplified by a rather rigid hierarchy wherein the racial groups are arranged by category from most desirable to least desirable. And this is not a consequence of choice by those who find themselves assigned arbitrarily to one or another such group. It is entirely a function of the system as it has been designed by those who have the power and the willingness to do so. Further, the very concept itself, civil rights, which suggests a preferred state of being for an entire national population, is in fact today coded language for offering belatedly opportunities for people of color and others to be included as equals in the body politic. You know, it's interesting to observe that this law, designed primarily to benefit newly freed slaves, actually, in the way it worked out, benefited many other people who had not been enslaved at all in this country or any country. Well, as it has been demonstrated time after time, offering these rights is not something that a majority of citizens find to be palatable. In 1954, however, in the wake of the Brown decision, many voices of opposition were raised in the halls of Congress. The 54 decision changed the law. Prior to that, the law had been that discrimination, segregation, and all the things associated with that were legal, supported by the Constitution. But in 1954, with the Brown case, that was all changed. There were fears about race mixing, and these fears were expressed from pulpits, academic podiums, boardrooms, neighborhood owners associations, PTA meetings, and taverns and beer halls all across this country. In the early 60s, and I'll never forget this, I was sitting in an auditorium at UCLA. Kenneth Clark, noted African-American psychologist, was giving a talk. And I took a seat in the front row. I had an unused legal pad and sharpened pencils, and I wanted to take down what he had to say. And as he began to talk, I mentally ticked off all the points. And I said to myself, you don't have to write that one down. You know that one well. You don't have to write that one down. And we got all the way to the end. And I thought to myself, but Dr. Clark, what are you going to tell me that's new, different? And then he said, almost as an aside, I think white Americans would devise ways to live in the ocean rather than support fair housing for black people. And I thought to myself, he's not gonna leave us on such a note of despair. He didn't. He followed that up with a yes, but, and he gave us his thinking about what would constitute reasons for hope. I didn't write that down either. Why? Because it didn't make any sense to me at that time. Still doesn't as I think about it. I won't burden you with it. Why, you might ask, does this situation remain? What drives a nation to be so blind to universal moral truths? Yes, civil rights laws have been passed with the intention of offering relief to black people on many fronts. That point is not in dispute. What is in dispute, however, is whether those actions have led to meaningful social change given the ongoing influence of systems, institutions, philosophies, practices, and ideologies developed over time in support of maintaining the status quo. I invite you to consider an element that may help you clarify why a growing body of civil rights law has not resulted in radical change in our society. Law appeals first and foremost to reason and objectivity. The unfortunate truth is that civil rights law involves issues that bypass the seat of reason and objectivity for most people, the cerebral cortex, and winds up instead being processed by 
elements of the limbic system, the seat of emotion and memory. Now, if it were simply and only a matter of reason, and if the majority of us as citizens were reasonable beings, it is quite likely that civil rights would be an artifact of the distant past. The logic upon which the laws were based would have persuaded the body politic to accept the rationale that all people were indeed intended to enjoy the freedoms and liberties available to most, and our historical tale would be a very different narrative indeed. But our history is what it is. And in large measure, because it is an unexamined history, we are saddled with the onerous status quo we experience today. James McCune Smith, an African-American physician and pharmacist, saw what could happen when the mind turns from reason to create mental images of black people that have nothing whatsoever to do with objective reality. In 1852, he wrote these words. The Negro with us is not an actual physical being of flesh and bones and blood, but a hideous monster of the mind, ugly beyond all physical portraying, so utterly and ineffably monstrous as to frighten reason from its throne and justice from its balance and mercy from its hallowed temple and to blot out shame and probity and the eternal sympathies of nature, so far as these things have presence in the breast and being of American Republicans. No, sir, it is a constructive Negro, a John Rowe and Richard Doe Negro that haunts with grim presence the precincts of this Republic, shaking his gory locks over legislative halls and family prayers. Can you imagine what would drive a learned man like Dr. Smith to write such a thing? Smith was able to see the profound impact of internalized belief systems as they were played out in his 19th century existence. Akin to his report, we have this following statement from a man soon to be our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, in a speech to an audience in Springfield, Illinois. Mammon is after him, ambition follows, and philosophy follows, and the theology of the day is fast joining the cry. They have him in his prison house. They have searched his person and left no prying instrument with him. One after another, they have closed the heavy iron doors upon him, and now they have him, as it were, bolted in with a lock of a hundred keys, which can never be unlocked without the concurrence of every key. The keys in the hands of a hundred different men, and they scattered to a hundred different and distant places, and they stand musing as to what invention in all the dominions of mind and matter can be produced to make the impossibility of his escape more complete than it is. Lincoln made his statement in 1857 in the wake of the Dred Scott decision. He could not have known how prescient a statement he was making at the time. But as we extrapolate from the reports of both these men, we see vestiges of their realities being played out in this year, 2018. Among the questions we must ask at this juncture is whether or not these messages from our past can be helpful as we seek to make changes in the way we operate today. I'm certain we will find clues about how to proceed if we are willing to care enough to confront self and each other about our distorted views of our own history. One prevailing narrative of our time is the idea that positive change is taking place over time, that as we mature as a people, we rid ourselves of our worst traits. Does an objective assessment of history support such a narrative? Does believing this story make it impossible for a person to see evidence to the contrary? It is imperative that we understand that racism is a congenital deformity that has crippled this country since its inception. 
For the good of America, it is necessary to refute the idea that the dominant ideology of our country is freedom and equality, while racism is just an occasional departure from the norm on the part of a few bigoted extremists. Those words were written by Dr. Martin Luther King in a seminal work printed in 1967, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. And others speak similar language in that same publication. Listen to what Dr. George Kelsey has to say in his book, Racism and the Christian Understanding of Man. Dr. Kelsey says, racism is a faith. It is a form of idolatry. Initially, it was an ideological justification for the constellation of political and economic power which were expressed in colonialism and slavery. But gradually, the idea of the superior race was heightened and deepened in meaning and value so that it pointed beyond the historical structures of relation in which it emerged to human existence itself. In her book, Race, Science, and Politics, Ruth Benedict expands on the theme by defining racism as a dogma that one ethnic group is condemned by nature to hereditary inferiority and another group is destined to hereditary superiority. It is a dogma that the hope of civilization depends upon eliminating some races and keeping others pure. It is a dogma that one race has carried progress throughout human history and can alone ensure future progress. In the early 60s, as a college student in Los Angeles, I discovered social anthropologist Ernest Becker's Birth and Death of Meaning. In that book, he wrote this, it is a task of culture to provide the individual with the firm conviction that he is an object of primary value in a world of meaningful action. Becker's thoughts were compelling, and I thought about his premise as I remembered what life had been like for me in Little Rock, Arkansas just a few years before. I moved to Los Angeles in 1958 in the wake of the Arkansas governor's decision to close all public high schools, and they remained closed for that year. And by the way, to explode the thought that perhaps this could be the most egregious such action, that is not true. The governor of Virginia in Prince Edward County closed elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools for four consecutive years. Culture, as I had experienced it in Little Rock, did not provide me with a firm conviction that I mattered in the least. In fact, what I experienced was the exact opposite. The governor's decision was a direct response to me and six other members of the original Little Rock Nine who were eligible to begin a second term at Central High School. One of our group had graduated, and another had been expelled from school and was now living in New York. The governor reasoned that if he closed the schools, he could keep the black kids out. His action was not designed to communicate to us that we were objects of primary value. His object was, however, in keeping with the way in which we had been treated as children in Little Rock for all of our lives. We were not welcome in most places by law and by custom. If Becker's premise has merit, we must hold society responsible for failing to provide us with that firm conviction that our lives did matter. Yes, schools were reopened the following school year, and five black students, including two from our original group of nine, entered in September 1959. Unfortunately, some would see the school's reopening as progress, as a defeat of a determined governor, but this would obscure the fact that racist ideology still informed decisions at every level of life in Little Rock, Arkansas. The governor was re-elected six times. He served from 1955 to 1967. Now, it is at this juncture that serious and in-depth conversation must take place. If we blithely conclude that progress has taken place since no enraged citizens are on hand to harass black students who wish to attend schools that formerly had been reserved for white students only, we choose to ignore a long list of compelling social dynamics. Research results in the field of education so that, show that public schools throughout this country 
are more segregated today than they were in 1954 when the Brown decision was handed down. This is not a surprising result when you have an unbiased, objective view of history. School integration is not and has not been a favorite outcome for the majority of white Americans, and it just so happens that this group is the best equipped financially to utilize private schools and other forms of non-public education. This combination of factors in concert with the white flight to suburban areas results in racially segregated public schools and mostly urban areas. And it is not the racial composition of the student body that makes this an urgent civil rights issue. It is the accompanying policy shifts and budget allocations that must demand our attention. We have to acknowledge as well the economic disparity between white people and black people brought on by a combination of unfair labor processes, practices, discriminatory lending policies, and continuing housing discrimination in spite of laws against all three. The impact of this reality is quickly felt in communities where school funding is tied to local tax dollars. Something else that demands our undivided attention is the rate at which black men are being disproportionately involved in police and Justice Department actions all around the country. In general, we find more improbable statistical data in America's police records of stopping, frisking, arresting, and in the Justice Department's record of charging, trying, convicting, and imprisoning men of color than we find in the records of other public service agencies. Now, looking at this through my psychologist lens, I see patterns that suggest strongly that black and brown men are seen as different beings than their white counterparts. In my role as adjunct faculty member at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, I work with groups of police officers from a variety of agencies, including city and county officers and sheriffs, highway patrolmen and patrol women, and members of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Unit of Homeland Security. In a recent session with Los Angeles City police officers, I asked whether or not the code NHI was still being used by officers who responded to calls. There was general agreement in the group that no such behavior was no longer tolerated. Officers were no longer able to report from the scene to which they had been called with a terse message, NHI, or no humans involved. I learned about this practice from a group of officers who had attended previous sessions. If the people involved in whatever activity had been reported were white Americans, NHI would have been inappropriate. But if they were black or brown, NHI was acceptable shorthand. Of course, many questions arise in the wake of such a startling revelation, not the least of which is, what if it is not a startling revelation? And then, of course, what would compel an officer of the law to refrain from use of deadly force if NHI was in play? There are many other questions to be asked, but suffice it to say, here is an area to be explored in the search for violations of civil rights and to discover how policy, planning, and training can help to create different outcomes from those we see all too often on nightly newscasts. And in developing the ideas for new policy, planning, and training, we have to also learn how to confront effectively the resistance from those who are called upon to implement the new ideas. Habits and patterns of response are difficult to eradicate because they tend to become deeply embedded in the human psyche. The larger question is this. What would compel members of a society to change the ways in which they have learned to perceive and characterize those deemed as other? In American society, black children often find that they are perceived to be much older than they really are and are held to adult standards of behavior. This has a massive impact on the life chances of especially young black males. Their civil rights are likely to be violated at a much higher statistical rate than those of white age group peers. In their recent research, social psychologists at the University of California have uncovered a most startling truth. 
Children in most societies are considered to be in a distinct group with characteristics such as innocence and the need for protection. Our research found that black boys can be seen as responsible for their actions at an age when white boys still benefit from the assumption that children are essentially innocent. This study by Philip Golf, PhD, was published in online, online rather, in APA's Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. The death of 12-year-old Tamir Rice at the hands of Cleveland police officers, Cleveland, Ohio, police officers is a graphic example of the disastrous results this misinterpretation can cause. This young boy, Tamir Rice, was seen as dangerous and threatening as an adult, a status often conferred simply because one is black and male, but egregiously more onerous when applied to a child. This example is but one of hundreds which play out in all those places where people of color congregate to be maligned in our society. But hopefully this gives us enough food for thought as we consider how to proceed to the next step. Last year, before the election of our current national leader, I was writing an article with content very similar to this talk I'm giving today. As I wrote, I glanced out my window, just in time to see a woman deliver yard signs to my next door neighbor. The signs were not elaborate, but simply stated Trump for president. Now, my neighbor will tell you that he's simply a lifelong Republican and will vote for any person nominated by his party. He's done this in the past. I respect his right to do both these things, to erect a yard sign of his choosing and to vote for his party's candidate. At the same time, I care enough to confront him about the implications of his choice in light of what I know about the history of our country, his candidate's shallow understanding of the same history, and the future of America with a national leader bringing the dubious credentials his candidate has to offer. This newly elected leader has said repeatedly that he wants to return to an America when things were great. The meaning is clear and unmistakable. The America he references is not one in which black people is one, pardon me, in which black people relegated to the margins of society as they had been until the civil rights movement of the late 50s and into the 60s. In his world, white men would regain their undisputed status as the only people whose lives really matter. Civil rights law then and civil rights now, civil rights law now, stands in support of a just and equitable society. One big question. How do we convince citizens that this is an honorable goal? Far too many of us have opted to remain cloistered in xenophobic, homophobic, racist, anti-Semitic, and patriarchal bubbles. Outside these hermetically sealed environments is the sunlight of objective truth. And if enough people are willing to exit these self-defined comfort zones, and even if we have to start with the least detrimental available alternative, to the current status quo as a first step, it will still be well worth the effort. Such a quest falls naturally under the rubric of forming a more perfect union. And it is this goal, having a union that exemplifies the very best ideals embedded deeply even in the approved national narrative for which I strive. What I wonder about is whether that goal is shared by my neighbor. And by the way, he didn't just stick one Trump for president sign in his yard, not two, he didn't just double down, he had five. By keeping watch, heeding the call, and speaking up, we can help change the course of history that has thus far led us in circles. The repetition of historical tragedy makes no sense when we have access to the full record. When we see X, we can know Y is not too far away. I urge you then to keep watch, heed the call, and by all means, speak up. Share your truth in the name of caring enough to confront. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now, we're going to have uh, microphones available for a Q&A session. Some of you have a chance now to speak your truth in this audience. Just stand right up. Questions for Dr. Roberts? And we will endure obligatory moments of silence as we await person number one. There she goes, <laughs> with urging by the VA. Hi. Um, this is something that I'm passionate about, and it is important to me. And um, I'm a young, upper middle class white woman. I mean, I have the privilege of coming here to a private school. I've been to private schools all my life. I have immense privilege. What? Can I, what are some things that you would advise or recommend for someone who would, who desires to educate those around me who are, have the same privilege level but aren't aware of it or don't feel the need to listen? You know, that's a very good question and the answer may not be as satisfying as you may expect. It is impossible to educate anybody People have to want to learn. If people choose to learn, then things are on a much different plane. Your task, however, is to learn as a first step. Learn as much as you can about you, about your society, about those around you, so that you are well informed. That's part of keeping watch. And as you do this, as you interact, you will hear the voices urging you to do something, whatever that is, and I don't know what it is. What I hear the voice telling me is, Terry Roberts, continue to speak. Go through the portals open to you wherever, whenever, and speak the truth you have to date, realizing that that truth may change over time, and be more than willing to speak your new truth when you have the next chance. No guarantee of success, no guarantee that you will achieve anything, but the satisfaction comes from knowing you gave it your all. Thank you. I like the way you put that. There were openings. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes. Essentially what happened in the wake of the Brown decision, the Little Rock School Board decided to obey the law. That in itself was revelatory. Never happened before. The initial plan made a lot of sense. The initial plan involved desegregating Little Rock schools at the level of kindergarten through third grade. Now, that makes absolute and total sense. It's not that often that you find a group of kindergartners who have been so soaked in the ideology of racial ideology that you'll find headlines saying race riot in kindergarten. You don't find that very often. The people in Little Rock knew this. They understood the ramifications and they said no to this plan. They forced the school board to recalculate. They came back in grades 10, 11, and 12. This did not totally mollify the opposition, but they were content for a while with that. And so it was that the call was put out to those of us who would be grades 10, 11, or 12, would you volunteer for such an experiment? 150 of us raised hands. In fact, the count was off by at least one. I had two hands up. So we went home and explained to our parents that we had so volunteered, those numbers dwindled down rapidly until the night before school, we were 10, a little rock 10. That 10th child was pulled out by her father who was threatened with loss of job if she continued. She did pull her out, he did lose his job, all of those things did happen. But that was the tenor of the times. That was the way things were. And my point today is that is not the way things have to continue to be, except the foundational elements are so deeply embedded in the human psyche in this country, it's going to be difficult to get rid of it. 
very difficult. So I'm saying to all of you that the job is not easy. Don't ever think it's going to be easy. But that's okay, because you're cut out to do the hard work. I know this. That's what this religion tells us. Seventh-day Adventism says you've got to work hard sometimes. Although, I must say to you, there was an Adventist minister in Little Rock who told me I had no business at Central High School. I don't know what was going on in his head, but <laughs> he then said, but, and there's always this ubiquitous but comma, since you're up there, you might as well stay. I thought he was just probably hedging his bet one way or the other. I never really figured out what he was saying. We didn't have much discussion after that. I find that my being around toxic people saps too much of my energy. I can't afford it. Thank you. Um, I can't imagine the terror of those days of high school for you. But I was wondering, was Ozark Academy an option for you or another Adventist school? Or why did you choose public school as opposed to an Adventist school? My relationship to Adventism is kind of weird. <laughs> you think about it. For instance, in, in Little Rock, I never knew there was such a thing as a white Adventist. We were so segregated. My whole world was populated by black people. I didn't know there was such a thing as Oakwood College until my sister, who was two years older, graduated high school and she chose to go to Oakwood. That was part of my learning curve. I didn't even know there was such a person as Ellen White until I got to California. And I told my peer group that I was an Adventist and they looked at me in horror and said, well, what about volume nine? <laughs> I'd never heard of volume nine. So I had to do a lot more research. I had no desire to go to a parochial school of any kind because I thought I needed to expand my horizons. I needed to be around people who were totally and absolutely different from myself if I were to truly learn what was going on. That was me, Terry Roberts. That's not a formula for everybody. And by the way, as I speak to you, I tell you who I am. If anybody says anything to you, that's all you're ever getting is a definition of the person speaking. Keep that in mind because that is so important. Too often we think that what the person is saying has something to do with us. No, no. You don't have to defend yourself against what other people say. All they're saying is this is who I am. Now, it's fine. You may choose to take umbrage at that point and say, well, I don't like who you are. Keep, keep that voice away. <laughs> That's a different thing. Uh, especially good for those of you who are married. Ooh, you gotta be careful. <laughs> Did you know, and this is just an aside, we're all unique and we're all imperfect. Why did I throw that in? Well, it just occurred to me that, that you should know this uh, because if you're expecting perfect, perfection, forget it. But that's, you know, that's the starting point. You know you're dealing with imperfection when you look in the mirror. You know you're dealing with imperfection when you look to your right or left. So deal with it. My question is a twofold question. Twofold? Twofold. Well, say it one at a time. My memory is shot. <laughs> okay, number one, how do you judge or how do you compare civil rights this last year versus under Obama? Could you talk to that? What's your question? Or Say that again. Civil rights for the, the, the last year since our new president has gotten into office. Has civil rights gone backwards or about the same? Or, or, or rather, the second question is, uh, under Obama, eight years, have the, did the civil rights improve or not so much? Oh, not so much, not so much. As you recall, as President Barack Obama operated with the intransigence of a Congress that spoke publicly about refusing to cooperate with him on any level, he was unable to enact meaningful legislation without employing tactics that were most creative in terms, especially in terms of the Affordable Care Act. 
But in terms of civil rights, no way on earth was he going to persuade that Congress to do anything at all about that. And so it is. The stuff I was talking about raises his ugly head even at that level. Did you know in the wake of the Brown decision, over 100 members of then US Congress signed their names to a document called the, what was it called? The Southern Manifesto. The Southern Manifesto. In that manifesto, these Congress people said, we will do whatever is within our power to prevent implementation of this dreaded Brown decision. So that gives you a sense about who these folk are. And by the way, thinking about the Congress, it is overpopulated with long-term members from the southern region of this country. They have so gerrymandered and so altered their voting laws that people of color are basically locked out. And so they send these people back repeatedly who gain seniority and then committee chairmanship. They have led to what some historians have called the southernization of the lawmaking body that we call the Congress. We're all impacted by that, folk. It is time for us to really think through what's going on. That is keeping watch, making what sure. Pardon? What about my first question about this? Oh, and I told you I had a poor memory. <laughs> so ask me again. <laughs> so under President Trump, have the civil rights gone down the drain, or where do you see that? Under so Trump? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out if he's asking that as a joke or what, but <laughs> no way on earth would there be any headway made in that arena with this current president. He says as much. He doesn't really give a rip. Those of you, by the way, who are Trump supporters, we can meet afterwards outside. We probably need to have a more in-depth conversation anyway. Yes. There's someone behind you. Um, it's easy to look at what happens in society and sometimes think here in our church we don't have any of this problem, which I think is very naive. And could you just speak a little bit about what's happening in the Adventist church, specifically in Andrews right now, when it comes to some of the unrest that's taking place? Because I think we sometimes have to look in the mirror too. I must plead complete and total ignorance of what's going on at Andrews. Can you help me out? Well, I'm not super knowledgeable. I just found out about this. Uh, we were having a game night for the church here, uh, here a few weeks back, um, New Year's, and one of the students was telling me that they actually had to get a whole administration to sort of oversee some of the racial unrest on the campus. Um, I was deeply uh, saddened to hear what was going on, and I think it followed a, um, a, a lecture that was given by a, a guest that came and kind of inflamed things on the campus. I don't know a lot more than that, but I, I just sometimes think that we tend to think that these things don't happen in our books of the church, and I think that's not the case. True. My remarks then, given that, will have to be very general and non-specific. In this country, regardless of where you are, within this denomination or without, we are subject to the forces that have been in place since the country's inception. As I said earlier, racial ideology is the basic foundational principle. The so-called democracy we have is layered on top of that. Thomas Jefferson's idealistic remarks about liberty and justice for all came much later than the institution of slavery and racist ideology. That is a, a formula for disaster over a long period of time, unless you can truly reconcile those, which we haven't. We've tried to, but it doesn't work. We've used all kinds of mechanisms, and in my reference to the support for that from theology, from law, from business, from academia, you see, it's all been a complicity. So it's not surprising that something like, what did you suggest, which I don't know, 
arises at Andrews, it won't be impossible for it to happen on an Adventist campus because it too is part of the body politic, all of it. I'm going to do some research on that, by the way. I didn't know this, but I'm, now I'm intrigued. What on earth happened up there? Wow. Okay. Yes, sir. You know, I have a, I have a comment. Uh, and, and we as Adventists, from Jonathan, uh, brought that, cheered this to my mind. 1964, when I was in Memphis, I think elementary, junior high, in the Adventist Academy in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, they were debating at that point whether they would integrate the Adventist Junior Academy. Three black families wanted to send their children to school, and the schools of the white families said, absolutely not, we're not going to let that happen. And I remember sitting there in the church, I was 14 years old, and they were battling this out, and they both said, we're not going to let any black uh, young men or young men or women come into the white school. It would cause problems, we're not going to let that happen. Well, in time, they came to their senses, and neither through legal reasons they had to do that. Things worked out fine. And uh, so we as Adventists, even back then, we had we had dirty, dirty hands and we can't look at the people around us and say we're holier than that. Right. Thank you. Mm, there's a questioner in front of you. I don't remember where home is for you right now. Uh, but out here in the Bay Area, uh, Berkeley has been a site of a great deal of uh, uneasiness and even violence um, as speakers have been uh, invited or disinvited to come to the campus. And I wonder what you think, what you would want to say to a campus like Berkeley or to the culture more broadly about allowing everybody to have a chance to to talk, whether we call it hate speech or what that might be, because it's it's pretty divisive, as you know. I think it's important to have the discussions, the dialogues, the encounters with others. You can do it if you learn how to manage your own process of understanding that we are all vulnerable to being triggered at the limbic system, the emotion will just spill over. But if you stay with it, if you stay with that dialogue, over time, you can slowly, slowly crawl up to the cerebrum and have the real discussion. Now, a lot of people are afraid, really afraid, to be in those environments. I don't know what the fear is all about. I think there's a fear that somehow there will be irreparable harm. I don't know. In order to ease that and make it possible for my own children, my two daughters, to have that ability, my wife and I used to invite known bigots home for lunch so our kids would have a chance to interact and have those discussions or understand what implacable barriers were there in the first place and also, more than anything, to understand that none of what the bigots brought had anything to do with them. That is so imperative, so imperative. And it's more difficult in a society, however, when you refuse to acknowledge the truth about who we are. We pretend that everything's okay. I call it a thin veneer of civility. I was thinking once, a few years ago, the political arena was in such disarray, I thought to myself, Terry Roberts, you should write a book on civility. And so I began to compile information. I had a manuscript started. And then one morning, getting ready for the day, I turned on my Bible app. I have the U version, of the Bible. And I started with Psalm 23. I love Psalm 23. It is so pleasing. But I was slow getting dressed, so I let the version play out. And the way it's set up is the narrator will go from one psalm to the next if you don't stop it. So it went through Psalm 24, 25, 26, 27, started 28. And then it got to verse 28.3. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Rewind, rewind. I played it back. Psalm 28.3 reads like this. Do not drag me away with those evil people 
who harbor, who speak cordially with their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. And I play that over and over again, and it convinced me that, Terry Roberts, you're working on the wrong thing. <laughs> you're working on stability, but you need to get to the root of the problem. You see, in my mind at that point, working on a book about civility was tantamount to an arborist trimming trees and turning them into beautiful shapes, while underneath the roots were diseased. So I abandoned that project. I threw away all those notes, and I will work on something else. I haven't yet decided what that's going to be. Not so much from the shock of that, but just because I'm very critical about what I am going to do with my time and energy. But at any rate, I suggest we continue this discussion out with refreshments. Thank you all for coming. I'll see you in the foyer.